Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar video. This is going to be my next Korra fan commentary track. This one's going to be for Book 4 Balance Episode 2, Korra Alone. So continue to recommend uh, or you know select episodes that you want me to uh, do as a future commentary track for Avatar or for Korra. Uh, looking for both of course. Um, but yeah, getting I suppose straight into the instructions here, I'm going to stop speaking as part of this introduction in a little bit, there'll be about a 10 second pause, and then when I start speaking again after that pause, that's when I'm going to hit play so I can start doing the commentary, and it's when you should hit play as well to be synced up with me, and uh, if you did that correctly, we should be within a second or two of each other, and the commentary track should be working uh, alright. So yeah, I'm going to stop speaking now. When I start speaking again, that's when you hit play. Okay, so here we are with K402 Korra alone. We're in early book four balance here. And the main thing here is that it's the setup from the previous episode. Korra has been revealed to have not come back to Republic City. She's kind of lied to both her parents and her friends and mentor. Where is she? It turns out she's fighting in this like Earth Rumble style MMA arena thing. That's sort of a bit underground. Wearing Earth Kingdom outfit, an Earth Kingdom outfit and no one, she's kind of un, un, in disguise. No one knows who she is what's going on here? It's nice to see her on her feet, she can bend again, but what's going on here? It's such a great shocking reveal and then this episode serves the purpose of really really nicely catching us up with this. Where has Korra been these last two years? How has she got to this point and where, what does she still need to go through before she's properly can come back? Obviously she's battered and bruised after her match, still walking around just on her own, you can see she's completely lost in thought. And here is why. The vision that keeps haunting her. The thing that keeps her away. Keeps her from coming back. And this is where it is, like I suppose, actually very symbolic. Of just this idea of this vision of her at like her worst moment. When she was nearly killed by Zaheer. This, you know, memory is physically beating her up to highlight that it's mentally beating beating her up and um, that's that's what it's all about here that she can't get past what happened to her why it happened um the fact that she she can't get past it that's the key and i think it's really well done and yeah the whole team is going to send her letters asami offers to stay And yeah, she initially here, I only plan to, you know, go away for a couple of weeks and hopefully like I can recover basically. And yeah, the new Air Nation will fulfill the role of the Avatar while she's gone. They said that in the finale for book three, they echo that here. But there's also that sense of like for Korra, the idea of like, you know, someone's replacing me. Like the, the fact that I need to be replaced in this. It, she wants to be out there doing it. And, and that's a key part in all of this as well. Is that Korra truly does want to heal fully. And get back into things and be the Avatar again. But there's also this other side to it. Where she also is kind of willing to use this excuse of like. No, no, no. I can't go back. Because I'm not ready. And like Toph is, is obviously points that out in a few episodes time. That like she is kind of using this as an excuse. But then later, it's just to be tough on her to push her to, you know, really get through it. And yeah, she hasn't gone to see Katara because of, I suppose, the fear of getting that diagnosis of, like, just how bad it is. Uh, I assume she's been healed, you know, a, a little bit up to now in the aftermath of Book 3 and what we've seen already. But as she goes, Katara's fairly positive about it. You know, it'll take time. You know, I can guide your healing, but it's mainly up to you it is up to your mentality about this how you know 
uh, hard you're going to go on this. Yeah, if you dedicate yourself to it, it'll happen. And I love the read on that. You know, that's what I want more than anything. She truly does want to get back. But obviously she struggles with these kind of um, mental barriers more than anything. The physical side, you know, she gets the physical recovery for the most part, apart from the remaining poison. That happens quickly, as is ever the case with Korra. But it's the spiritual side, the mental side, that's what holds her back. And I, I love the excitement from Korra there as she sees the first movement, the first step in the progress of recovery. And the, it, it's, it's a struggle from here. And you can see the frustration build here as they focus on this for a good amount. Like it can seem slow, but it's great character development as they're showing, you know, your main character go through such a struggle. Yeah, and you're really struggling with it. Usually she's, you know, never give up, but she she does, you know, it, it shows her kind of giving up there, showing that how much of a struggle this is. And that she has to read the letters about air, all the amazing things her friends are doing, and like she already knows the air, air nomads are, you know, helping the world out. Uh, while she, in her mind, is just, you know, kind of doing nothing, just recovering. And it's that responsibility she puts on herself because she truly wants to be the Avatar. That's always been Korra's thing. Aang is the reluctant Avatar. Korra is the one who has wanted to be the Avatar since she was little. Since she found out she was, I suppose, the Avatar, multi-bender. That's what she wanted. Mako mentioned uh, Red Monsoons. Pretty interesting. And yep. That's Bolin revealing he's part of the Earth Empire. He wants to help stabilize the Earth Kingdom. That is something that, like, okay, cool. Bolin really cares about that side of things. That may link into him wanting to be a politician, where we are now in the comics. But we have to see where they go. And yeah, she continues to sort of try again, but she's frustrated by the lack of kind of steady progress. And here's the frustration, taking it out on Katara here, but Katara handles this so well. Again, the voice acting performance is really, really well done here. And I like how she, she kind of knows of like, I blew up at you, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but Katara gets it. Why did this happen to me? I'm tired. Like, definitely, like, bordering on, like, giving up. And, like, that's so unlike Korra, which makes this such a you know, terrible position for her to be in. And yet, Katara's just like, you're not the only person in the world who has, has felt like this. You're not the only avatar who's felt like this. Aang had to deal with the loss of his entire people. He chose to find meaning in his suffering and he found peace he didn't let the loss of the air nomads destroy him completely it affected him but he moved past it and was able to you know make the best of the situation that they have and it's a it's a good use of Katara's experience with Aang to help the current avatar I love that Naga's watching on you know it's just that characterization of the animals once again of just Naga watching Korra who's hasn't really been moving that much recently seeing her actually make progress here like she kind of perks up and it's, it's really just nice that like Korra is walking down this kind of these bars into sort of Naga's arms again the, the music is really great here like oh the sort of return of the avatar almost type thing but not quite again this shows like she, she's made the first step in the recovery the physical recovery is now on its way but as we see, as we cut back to the present, she's still really, really heavily dealing with the mental side of things, which is what caused her to be like that in the first place and how she really hasn't been able to properly deal with that. You know, someone tried to kill her, to poison her. And especially because, like, her relationship with Zaheer was so, 
like just you know hero and villain of all of the villains like i suppose there was the least proper true connection so it was like zaheer was always the sort of um least uh, had the least dynamic in a way with you know her and kuvira are quite similar you know her and aman had kind of those you know moments together he really challenged her unalak of course was her uncle but here it, like zaheer was just you know they had one conversation and then basically the next time they met he was just trying to kill her straight up and this is obviously the spirit kind of disguised as a dog it is interesting in that, like, what are you meant to make of the fact that the, that the spirit could seemingly see what Korra could see? Is it just a case of, like, because she's the Avatar, her her feelings, like in the spirit world, but in maybe a lesser way in the physical world, do have a effect on the world around her? And I like this callback to the very first episode of her trying to impress everyone, including Tenzin, by, like, I'm ready to get back. Look, I'll do the test again that I was amazing at initially. If I can do this again, it'll highlight that I'm ready to go again. And it seems like she's ready to go. She has the acrobatic stand. The power of her bending seems like it's it's, it's okay. It's all right. And she's doing well, pretty well up to now. Again, she's sort of like dealt with them at this point, pretty much. But right as she's about to go on the offensive, the vision causes her to he hesitate memories of the past that that fight with Tahir causes her to hesitate because in a way if she passed the test she'd be back in action could she get hurt again and there's definitely an element of that here as much as she truly wants to get back there's also something holding her back with regards to what if she does get back and she gets hurt again what if some other villain pops up and tries to do the same thing to her And yeah, the whole be patient thing, you understand her frustration at everyone saying that. It doesn't mean a lot to her here. But no, she she was this close to making you know hundred percent progress and she sort of felt like she's failed at the last hurdle and she's even more frustrated. Two years have passed here to your reply to Asami here. I, I still maintain that like I think this was a little ill thought out to make kind of the core of the core Asami relationship be about like oh she only chose to reply to Asami. I don't it, it more speaks to like why doesn't she want to speak to Mako and Bolin like because I don't think at this point they've really characterized the importance of the asami core dynamic enough to really have us as the audience understand specifically why only asami can be wrote, wrote back to when arguably you'd say given the evidence of the scenes prior to this she probably has a better dynamic with daimako or bolin in the lead up to all of this and yeah this is she's so close to really making the breakthrough here of like basically the lesson ends up sort of being in a way of what she learns from Toph is like to be with the people you love and let them help you through this and if she had just committed to going to Republic City she probably could have made the last few steps along the way with her friends but there's definitely an aspect of like she doesn't want to go back and have everyone see her as this weaker avatar who can't as is evidenced by this scene, even deal with the most basic of incidents. And she's sort of a, a little bit confident here, happy about making some progress. Love the Ang reference here. He's doing the Warriors of Kyoshi kind of spinny thing in his hands. This guy is now like, oh, my place is famous because of the previous avatar. I'll have the current avatar's picture. It'll be great. But yeah. She's about to make this huge step of progress and she encounters an incident that she should be able to deal with that would prove that she's able to come back. And again, she stumbles because of what she hasn't dealt with up to now. And they're also confident. 
because they've obviously heard about like how tough uh, the current avatar is and like okay like he fired a bit of sand at her there a little a couple of rocks like but that didn't come across as being a particularly talented bender she just really didn't deal with that attack very well and they were really like questioning like that was kind of (laughs) weak And because of that, as she arrives back on the shores of Republic City, she's thinking about, like, am I good enough to come back? And then the vision returns. The fear aspect of it also pops up. What she really, really hasn't dealt with. And she turns away and decides to basically, you know, go undercover this is where she makes the decision to like lie to her parents that she's already there lie to you know Mako Bola and Tenzin and so on about like oh I'll be coming shortly and um, put on the Earth Kingdom outfit cut her hair explaining most of the position we find her in in the uh, at the end of the first episode of this book and again like it's very similar to the whole idea of like Zuko's journey that you know, Zuko alone is a part of, of the cutting of the hair, the symbolism of that. And in this case, you know, it being, you know, Korra also wanting to go undercover, not be recognized by her signature sort of triple ponytail uh, hairstyle that she usually has. And she goes to investigate why she can't connect with Rava. That's one of the big things they said earlier in the episode, um, that she hasn't been able to go into the Avatar state. So, tree of time of course she should be able to make a spiritual connection here if there is any and she can still talk to the spirits of course but she's not getting any spiritual like really power from herself so something is turned off within herself with regards to her spiritual energy and they don't sense rava's energy from her either now this is an interesting part because the steps of Korra's recovery are interesting in that it is like multi-stage in this episode we see her sort of physical recovery in like the the calling and stuff like that we see the next stage of her recovery as she gets the rest of the metal out and is able to unlock the avatar state but still no connection to rava and it takes until episode nine beyond the wild for her to go into the spirit world with sort of zahir's guidance and um, to finally reconnect with rava The only issue I really have with it is on a technical level of how are the Avatar State and Rava separate things given what we know about Rava and the origin story and and how the Avatar works. It just feels very weird that she can actually go into the Avatar State, which she does in her fight against Kavira in episode 6 after her recovery with Toph, but then the the rediscovery of Rava is this separate stage. It's it's a bit awkward. I, I think the idea ultimately is that this is where you get into the idea of spirituality in the Avatar world is part uh, physicality, part like mental, your actual view on spirituality. In that with Toph, she finishes off the physical aspect. She gets the rest of the poison out, which I suppose allows the energy within her body to flow, allowing the sort of Rava energy in a way to flow, but still hasn't spiritually reconnected with herself and uh, Rava uh, I suppose not being able to really talk to the entity that Rava is because it takes until beyond the wild for her to really I suppose personally you know deal with the person who she's so afraid of and so until she deals with that she can't get the person that is the avatar state back Uh, probably bad way of saying that but I, I think you get the idea that I'm going for here at least that that's my rough explanation of like why they separate the two like that. But at this point we've basically caught up. It's now Korra actively pursuing that vision. And the vision sort of taunts her into... You get in here and fight. If you can win, maybe you are good enough to go back to being the Avatar. But if you can't, it's, it's proof that you're not good enough. And we see what Korra sees in this fight previous in the at the end of the previous episode we just saw her fighting the earth kingdom girl but here we see the Korra. her view on this fight is that it, it is her actually fighting that vision of herself and this is where it is very very symbolic of like this 
mental barrier, this mental opponent is having a physical impact on her. Core is being beaten up physically and mentally by this thing. And yeah, she's at the swamp. So we know we're going to deal with some spiritual stuff. Now this was obviously spoiled to us a little bit because like they definitely overly teased this and basically committed to the idea of like, oh yeah, you're going to see Toph. And so this would have been a really cool thing if it was a true and honest surprise. Um, but it's still a great moment because like Toph has been teased. Like we got a brief explanation about Toph in like book three about like, oh, she's different, you know, like she's sort of like spiritual, achieved enlightenment. She She went on a journey to like, you know, D- d- disconnect from the world in a way so like whoa what happened to Toph and we're going to get to meet her at the end but of course in the swamp the visions that you have are more real there's more meaning to them so Kor's already been having very vivid um, visions so now all of a sudden it's 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 more intense than ever and this is where like it really emphasizes the idea of like this ultimately is all happening in her head but she's acting like it's it's affecting her physically here. And again, that's why this episode is so well done. Because it is just a pure character piece. You wish they were able to do something like this for, you know, Mako, Asami. Bo Lin gets kind of character piece episodes as well but uh unfortunately not really mako or sammy and again this is another great visual of it of just like that's super symbolic the, the the mercury is the thing that's holding her back at this point and this is her sort of being dragged into it you know almost to her death that this is still what's affecting her at this point but obviously this stuff isn't here so it's meant to more just be the idea of that like the swamp dragged her in to find Toph the sort of tough love teacher that she needed obviously very different Toph here straight away living in the swamp that doesn't exactly feel like her Toph has obviously gone through a lot over the course of her life to be like this. Whereas Katara is very, you know, similar. She's what you'd expect from an older Katara. But this Toph is very different. Like Zuko and Aang are both what you'd expect of them when they're older. The little bit we saw of Sokka is the same. But Toph is very different. Like Toph plus spirituality, that, that almost doesn't fit completely. And of course, you know, Kor would know about this. She knows about, you know, Aang's team. The Twinkle Toes line is really great to sort of uh, round off the episode just to confirm that, like, yeah, Toph knows who the new Avatar is, and um, so that's that's really good. And obviously, it's because she can sense it through the swamp. That's basically the idea. That's how she keeps up with the world because she's so connected to everything in the swamp. So, and that and that's what that's another part of Korra's journey here is to learn to reconnect to the people who care about you that like in a way the biggest mistake the core makes in this episode is kind of the same mistake Zuko makes on his journey is like going off alone like yes did allow him to you know learn stuff on his own but like it's the same sort of stuff he could have learned if he stayed with Iroh and it's it's similar here of like yes Korra learned on her own she eventually found her way to the right place but if she had just went back and got the support of her friends and everyone else it it also would have happened. So that's another important step in the journey, the reconnection through the swamp and it happens so wonderfully and like the calling and so on. So I, I think it's definitely like one of Korra's like greatest strengths as a series is just what they do with Korra's character arc 
over all four books. Like, I, I know some people criticize book two quite heavily. I absolutely don't because I think book two is some of Korra's strongest development in the entire series. In that, if we don't have book two, we don't have Korra in any way developed enough to undergo what she goes through in this book. Uh, the book two stuff of learning to be spiritual in the first place, like from Unalak and so on, it's so, so, so important. Um, but, um, yeah, th this episode is just fantastic. Um, I believe I have this rated as absolutely, I think it's in my top five Korra episodes. I think it might actually be my number, uh, two episode. Um, I'll quickly look it up, actually. Okay, looked it up. It's actually my number three rated episode. So, of course, you guys know, Beginnings Part 2 is my favorite episode. I have second is a Light in the Dark, so the final episode of Book 2. But this is for sure number three. Like, my top three are a clear-cut top three. This is some of the best Korra stuff that we have. Top tier episode of Korra, 100%. So, yeah, in the comments, uh, again, let me know what other episodes you want me to do commentaries for. But also, more importantly, what are your thoughts on this episode? This important character development episode for Korra, Korra alone. But that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.